Reynold Siegler is a jewelry artist who explores jewelry's potential to hold more than purely decorative attributes and conventional connotations. His jewelry objects are not intended to reflect the individual personality of the wearer, but to link the individual with the universal phenomena. <clears throat> in his first exhibition, Gravity, that was on Galerie Format in Oslo in 2011, investigated different aspects of this universal and all-embracing physical force. In his second exhibition, Cosmic Debris, at Christopher Wunne in 2014, and also in Galerie Wittenbrink in Munich and Galerie Maison Paul Fort in Paris, he used meteorites, meteorites as an expression for the pro proto matter from which our entire solar system is built. <coughs> in 2016, he started focusing on life and created the exhibition Lust for Life, was also on Galerie Wittenbrink in Munich. Here, he worked with uh, meteorites containing amino acids and fossils from first stages of life on the planet. <coughs> and in his latest exhibition, Nearly Human, at Kunstnerforbundet, uh, just now, <coughs> uh, previously this year, he focused on human life and tools from the Stone Age. And now, welcome to us, Reinald, to tell us more about this intriguing art jewelry. Thank you, Andre. And now you have told the whole lecture. Um, well, I have chosen a perhaps somewhat uh, pretentious title, Matter and Consciousness, but it's actually very easy, so don't worry. I'm going to show a lot of pictures, and it's actually about uh, how I look upon materials and ideas. So I would like to start with this man. He means a lot to me an Inuit wearing his talisman on his chest and on his back. Small leather bags fastened with leather straps to be worn under the clothes. Containing figurines carved from branches from a raven's nest. He has killed a man and feared revenge from the dead man's soul. This talisman should protect him against this revenge. I was struck with Ave the first time I saw it in a museum in the Nook, Greenland. I thought, what a fantastic belief in materials. After that, I made many works that honored the talisman tradition. Here, orange pouch from 2013. It is made of leather, silver and nylon cord. I haven't put anything into it. I leave it to the wearer to decide what material or object that could bring magic to his or her life. And here, violet pocket from 2012. It is made of leather, brass, silver and steel. Even though I have a strong passion towards materials, I don't share the Inuit's somewhat superstitious faith However, I have always sensed that there was a deep wisdom connected to the talisman tradition. And for years, I searched for a plausible explanation. I got the answer from this man, the French philosopher Georges Bataille. I don't have time to dig deeply into his profound philosophy, but I have to present the words that opened my eyes. We find the state of affairs that binds us to our random and ephemeral individuality hard to bear. Along with our tormenting desire that this evanescent thing should last, there stands our obsession with the primal continuity linking us with everything that is. <coughs> what Bataille is saying here is that the human being is caught in a kind of dilemma where on the one hand it wants to defend and justify its position as a unique individual, while on the other hand it longs for the experience of being part of something bigger or something more enduring, which is sometimes calls continuity and other times everything that is. And with the help of that phrase I was suddenly able to make an interpretation of the talisman 
that could suit an artist in the 21st century. The talisman is an object that links the wearer with everything that is, symbolically. And I knew immediately that this was exactly what I wanted to do. After a while, I was even able to formulate a kind of statement for my art. It is as follows. Rather than aiming to highlight the individuality of the wearer, which is so predominant in the art jewelry field, I searched for expression that instead might connect the individual with the universal, or more poetically, with everything that is. So from that moment on, I searched for ideas and materials to express this. And with that perspective, it is tempting to suggest that the objects and the materials used to make them stand above the subject, as was the case with the Inuit and the talisman. And the funny thing is that the syllable sub actually means under. And also with that perspective, it was easier to understand what Bataille meant when he said that for the experience of continuity, the human being has to let go of both the rationality and the individuality. For my first solo exhibition in 2011, I found gravity as a perfect topic to express everything that is. This enigmatic force that permeates the whole existence as we know it. Gravity binds all matter together. Without gravity, there wouldn't have been any physical existence. I was also intrigued by the fact that science didn't know what it was at that time. The following year, though, there was a breakthrough in CERN in Switzerland where they found the so-called God's particle, the particle that gives mass to the atoms. This is called mass and is made of granite, silver and leather cord. And this is mass number two, also made of granite and silver but with nylon cord. Not so heavy though, but it falls to the ground. It is called leaf and is made of briard, the root wood used to carve pipes, and silver and cotton cord. This is called axis, made of wood, silver and leather cord. This is called quadrant, inspired by one of the first navigation instruments that we know. Its function is based on gravity, as the plum indicates the angle to the lodestar. I let the graining in the wood do the job as a scale. It is made of wood, silver and nylon cord. This is called apple. It was too tempting to resist referring to the apple that fell on Newton's head as he discovered the gravity force. It is made of painted wood and leather cord. This honors another great scientist within the gravity topic, Albert Einstein. As he states in his theory of general relativity, gravity influences time. It is made of glass tubes, sand, silver and a leather cord. It's called hourglass. This is called moon. It refers to the fact that the gravity of the moon causes tide water. And this is called black hole. It is a visual interpretation of the phenomenon of extreme gravity forces out there in space. So extreme that it would have pressed the earth together to equal the size of a pea. Both are made of granite, silver and leather cords. The gravity project made me interested in the universe. And in my next project, Cosmic Debris, I used meteorites both as material and theme. This is a weathered fusion crusted meteorite, made of stony meteorites, silver and nylon cord. The mechanism is a so called kardang or universal joint. It has two axes perpendicular to each other, so it can move as freely as it did in space, or at least almost. 
I put a lot of effort in making the mechanisms in my jewelry objects because they actually represent the element that connects. Meteorites come from asteroids. They orbit between or the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. When asteroids collide, it happens that pieces may break off. Some of them land at our planet. They move with a speed of approximately 100,000 km an hour. When they meet the atmosphere of our Earth, the friction produces so much heat that they start to burn and explode. Most of them burn out as shooting stars. The material that survive is shaped by this dramatic encounter. As the small meteorites in this brooch, the burned surface is known as fusion crust. The title of the work is Meteorites in the Formation of Cassiopeia Constellation. Many meteorites come from the area we know as Cassiopeia. Apart from meteorites, it is made of silver and steel. And here, meteorite cone. It is made of a cut and polished meteorite with silver and nylon cord and with the same universal joint mechanism. Meteorite ball. The ball can mo move freely within the silver frame. And this is Widmannstetten structured meteorite. It is made of an iron meteorite with a structure that doesn't exist on planet Earth. This is due to an extremely slow cooling process, decreasing by one degree every two, 200,000 years. And here, weathered fusion crusted meteorite 2. After that project, I was invited by curator uh, Gertrude Steinsvog to participate in Tendenza 2016, where she focused on the role of the material in contemporary arts and crafts. I made a series called the Origin Series, consisting of three brooches. The first one is called the Origin Series 1, Matter. In the middle, you see a cut and polished slice of stony meteorite. The granular structure stem from cosmic stardust that for more than 3.5 billion years ago was the starting point for the formation of our solar system. This stardust was melted to granules by a source that might have been our own sun. Later, it was pressed together to form larger pieces. Some of them grew big enough to become planets. Others became asteroids. This material thus represents the protomatter from which the entire solar system is built. The square frame is chosen because the square represents the fundament for our existence, according to Carl Gustav Jung's theory of archetypal symbols. And the frame is made of rusted iron. It is meant to say something about durability. And here is a close-up of the granular structure from which we all are made. This is the Origin Series 2. Oi. Okay. This is the Origin Series 2, Life. In the middle of this brooch you see a carbonaceous meteorite. It contains amino acids the building blocks for life. There is a scientific research going on to find out if the preconditions for life here on Earth could have arrived here through meteorites. It is fascinating to think about that this material is most likely spread elsewhere in the universe. I have chosen a hexagonal shape because carbon exists in hexagonal structures and because it reminds us of honeycombs where the bee larvae are being nurtured. I have chosen gold for the frame because the color hints at nectar. And this is the Origin Series 3, Spirit. 
In the middle you see a meteorite from the moon. The moon is considered to be the spiritual planet because it follows the earth like a shadow or spirit if you like. I have chosen a circular shape because it equals the shape of the moon and because it is the symbol of the spiritual, according to Jung. The frame is made of titanium because this is the material that was used for building the spaceship that brought man to the moon. So far, I had almost exclusively focused on matter in my art. Now it was time to focus on life. My third solo exhibition was titled Lust for Life and was shown in Galerie Wittenbrink in Munich in 2017. The starting point was a pendant with a carbonaceous meteorite with the title, title Lust for Life Meteorite with the same elements as in the brooch, gold and the number six. I showed it alongside with fossils from the earliest life stages on Earth. This is called Precambrian microbe structure. The circular structure stems from the so-called stromatolites, which are among the oldest life forms on the planet. It was an algae culture that had chlorophyll and thus was able to produce oxygen through photosynthesis. Most likely, it was this algae that made it possible for more advanced life forms to develop. This is called From the Cambrian Explosion and shows a trilobite from the Cambrian period when life on Earth exploded. It is made of wood, silver and steel wire. And this is called From the Mesozoic King and shows a tooth from one of the biggest and most aggressive dinosaurs, the Spinosaurus. It is mounted in silver with a leather cord. And the model is my 95 year old father. This is called transition and shows a petrified excrements, petrified excrements from a tortoise mounted in silver with a leather cord. After having focused on general life, it was time to focus on human life. Not on individual human life though, but rather on the origin of a humankind. My fourth solo exhibition was titled Nearly Human and was shown earlier this year at Kunstnerforbundet as a part of the group exhibition Everyone Says Hello, curated by Lars Sture. One of the most important characteristics of humankind is the extensive use of tools. For the Nearly Human project, I have chosen tools from the Stone Age and incorporated them in jewelry objects. In doing so, I changed the function to being symbolic. And the faculty of symbolizing is another strong characteristic of humankind. This is called Assembled Stone Age Scraping Tool and is made of stone, silver and leather cord. By the way, I think it's nice that the tools can be taken out of the jewelry object and be used. And this is assisted stone age banging tool. Here I have put on an oak handle for the stone that I imagine to be a hammering tool. And this is stone age paraphernalia. The carabiner is handmade in silver and must be taken off to dismantle the stone. And this is assembled stone age tool with a leather bag made by hand to fit exactly around the stone. And this is assembled stone age utensil. This carabiner is also made by hand in silver. And this is assembled Stone Age banging tool, the biggest tool in the series. And prepared Stone Age arrowhead, the smallest one. Four centimeters. 
While Nearly Human focuses on physical aspects of human life, the next project, the Human Soul series, focuses on the spiritual. The series is a combination of Western alchemic symbols and Eastern colors, color symbols related to chakras. A chakra is, according to ancient Eastern spiritual understanding, energy centers scattered along the human spine from the root upwards and through the head, each with different psychic energy and each with their own color. As I see it, this is the most profound understanding of color I have ever encountered. And for those who think this is a quack philosophy, I actually experience these uh, energy centers through my own meditation. This is the Human Soul Series 1, base. The cube and the square represent uh, wholeness, the ground, the physical world we live in. It's about physical well-being, and the color is red. Like the spinal cord, these pendants have a hole in the center. I have given them a universal joint connection so they can move in all directions, as the spine does. The Human Soul Series 2, genital. Ovoid is the shape of the genitals in men and women, and the color is orange. The Human Soul Series 3, gut. The center in the middle of the abdomen. It is about intuition and gut feeling. The color is yellow. The Human Soul Series 4, heart. The center for feelings and emotions. And love. The force that connects and thus grows outward like rings in the water. The mental color is green. The Human Soul Series 5, Throat, the center for speech and verbal communication. The color is blue. The Human Soul Series 6, Epiphysis, the center in the middle of the skull for higher consciousness, also called the third eye. The color is indigo. And finally, the Human Soul Series 7, Crown, the energy that point upwards to the universe, or everything that is, if you like. And the color is violet. For each energy center upwards, we encounter a higher state of consciousness. And this development is often symbolized by a tree, or three interconnected trees. All the pendants in this series are thus made of wood. I love materials, but I always choose them consciously. I want them to represent something, values, ideas. The ideas always comes first in my art. Fundamentally, I'm inspired by words. So I never use materials for pure delight. My aim is not to please the senses. My aim is to awaken consciousness, pure consciousness. Consciousness is that in us which is aware of things. And that awareness is different from matter, as I see it. It is also different from thoughts and feelings and sensations. However, we are dependent on matter to be aware of that distinction. And that's why I make objects. I like to believe that objects might help to awaken consciousness. And ultimately, consciousness is what we are. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Reynal, for a very nice presentation. Are there any questions? I would like to ask you how big are these pieces? The biggest Stone Age uh, banging tool is like this. 20, 23 centimeters, and the smallest, the arrowhead, was about four centimeters. Mm. This one is like this, seven. Mm. Nice question. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, 
Um, I notice you're wearing a brooch. Do you ever wear your own talisman as well? I mean, I wear them all the time, not only yours, but this aspect of jewellery is really um, important one to me and obviously to you. Do you wear them daily? Or? Yeah, I yeah. do. Yeah. 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 But for the last um, two years, I think. Yeah. Earlier, really I didn't uh, yeah. <laughs> dare to. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't dare to? No, it was embarrassing to wear my own th things. Mm -hmm. But now I don't consider them to be my own things, so and it's easy to wear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a silly question. No. <laughs> so uh, I'm interested in this consciousness thing. So y you're, uh, and also I was wondering in the beginning whether all of your, uh, you call them jewelry at the same time, to me it seems like they're no different from sculpture. Uh, it could have been, you could have called them sculpture and I wouldn't have wondered. And But they're all to be worn, I guess. And does that sort of, does that, uh, like if I'm the bearer of this, will it uh, physically help me to become more conscious in my everyday life? Is that uh, what you're thinking with it as a piece of jewelry? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, the first thing is um, uh, I don't call them jewelry. As I made the meteorite project, I had a philosopher, uh, Halvor Nurby. He's a language philosopher, had a PhD in Wittgenstein, I think. And actually, I hired him to find out what I should call my things. And the conclusion was um, jewelry objects. <laughs> So that's what they are. <laughs> and uh, in that same uh, publication, I was uh, talking with uh, Andre, I think. Yeah, it was with Andre. And um, I was um, uh, talking about uh, the somewhat um, self contradictory aspect that I made them as usable as uh, possible, but at the same time, you don't have to wear them. I think it's a nice thing that you can wear them, but you can also have them o on the wall. And I have made uh, wall plates that are often included in the work, so people can hang it on the wall. And then it's an, an object for contemplation, or just to look at. It's, it, but the answer is that it's up to the, the owner or the wearer how they would use it. actually have them with you when you meet the world or meet other people I guess according to your lecture mm -hmm. I mean it will mean something if you meet physically another person and you're wearing this thing or another object it would do something to the situation wouldn't it? yeah it can so that's also a self-contradictory thing that Andre also put out in in the text I had in the, that book <laughs> that <laughs> you wear it and as soon as you wear it 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 interacts socially. <coughs> but consciousness is actually always a matter of a choice. So I use it as a reminder for myself uh, that I can look ip upon it in different ways. Last question. Yeah? <laughs> Did you read the book of uh, Turing Moy, Språk uh, och Märkeslet? No. Uh, language and uh, Consciousness? I'm sorry. Should no, I? According to, or you think about it, uh, both in language and in just in the practice of the work. Yeah. What was the name of her, her again? Turil Moy. Turil Moy, yeah. Uh, very yeah. Okay, thank you. May I ask you what is the weight of this one? It seemed to be very heavy, but... Yeah, it is heavy, um, because the meteorites contain iron, so they are a little bit more heavy than, for mm. example, granite, the earthly stones. But, yeah. But you can carry it, or...? Yeah, yeah, it's no problem. 
There were more questions behind that. I just wonder how you relate to uh, ownership. Um, thinking about it, it's a meter right, and if you put it on yourself as a um, something you own, what kind of thoughts do you have around this? And also the um, fossils. Mm. No, I. Also, I. G I get them physically from what I call the meteorite man. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very nice fellow. And, and he buys all those things uh, legally. <laughs> so when I buy them, I buy them as I buy a, a thing that can be bought. <laughs> and then I do something with it and sell it for a much higher price <laughs> 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 when I sell. <laughs> Consciousness uh, uh, regarding this, yeah. how we relate to nature, and um, in the context of human materialism, how d how do you think about this? Yeah, ethical issues? but 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 the answer is almost the same as for for her, for her that consciousness is always a matter of choice. So you, c we are living in a physical world and we have physical things, but it all depends on how we look upon them. And the answer to your question is that I actually don't uh, look upon them as my belongings, for example, and others shouldn't do that either, but they can. Uh, yeah, but it's up to them. Yeah. yeah, maybe. I think it was very interesting what um, Jan was saying about uh, Aborigines in Australia that didn't even have a word for property. Any more questions? Not a difficult one. No, it's not difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, um, how do you uh, relate to the fact that a lot of the references in your work is scientific? So it's created, uh, you know, the knowledge you have is obtained through like humans' use of scientific methods, which are often, you know, like um, built on dualist principles, uh, you know, what is not and what is and separation and, uh, you know, the human act of uh, trying to systemize what the world is. Um, so you've, you've attained a lot of the knowledge through, you know, our human sciences, uh, which is, um, well, intrinsically uh, based on, you know, dualism and uh, something that is um, created by man, whereas the meteorite is ancient, you know, way preceding human activity. So do you even, do you think about the fact that you're using the tools uh, or the knowledge made by science, by human language, which is full of faults, full of limitations, and referring to everything there is, mm. the universe, and trying, do you, do you see the um, possible, let's say, uh, dissonance there? Yeah, I see it. And actually I also use it but I um, what what I'm actually doing is that I I search for materials and things that can um, induce Ave in a way. So that's more important to me what we don't know about it as what we know about it. And what we know about those things, th they are making and producing an awareness of what we don't know. This is just a side comment. Um, Sorry, it's a comment, not a question. Not, not a question, I'm, ju I'm just adding on to uh, Marianne's question. Because mm. I think on the one hand you have a, you know, an, an awareness or an, an interest above uh, you know, normal, I would have said in jury, uh, when it comes to the scientific uh, references in your work. But you also have a very strong link to the holistic or the spiritual world in, in the same very same work. Mm. Yeah. 
I have. Yeah. That's my and intention. Yeah. To, yeah. No, but so I, thank I, you. I think that becomes a very <laughs> important aspect when you, when you start talking about the, uh, you know, the certainty of the science or the uncertainties of the science and the limitations. Because I mean, you have it's mirrored by, by the holistic side or the spiritual, the spiritual side of things. Mm. Any more questions? Thank you for a very interesting uh, lecture. I wonder um, if you can say something about uh, uh, just to uh, or to to uh, start my question. Uh, the philosophy of new materialism is about um, a change of perspective, so to speak. Is to it is to force ourselves to 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 uh, address that du the duality between mind and matter uh, is something that we need to rethink. So maybe the we need to be with objects or matter in another way in the world. Uh, and I wonder, uh, and maybe we need it really right now because of the situation of the politics, uh, uh, the situation of the, um, we have to rethink the way we are with materials. Uh, it's uh, necessary to do that now. So I wonder if you could say something about, um, and I think you already did in the lecture, but elaborate uh, on it. Uh, what do these materials do? Do they have, um, not a consciousness, because then you will reproduce this dualism, but do they do something when you have them, wear them, exhibit them? Um, can, can you, by making this actually address this um, shift of perspective? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I can contribute a little bit. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I think... You said something about the chakra thesis, that you experience it. Could you just say something more about that? That's very difficult to say something about, but um, th that it's a part also when you are conscious, and that is not thinking and not feeling, uh, the body relaxes and you notice uh, the surroundings and the body uh, in a different way as when you think and feel. <laughs> and when the body relaxes and you you are aware of that, I can feel that uh, these centers are uh, enlivening in a way. It feels like uh, cribbling. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure, pleasurable feeling actually. <laughs> but I can't control it. I can't, no. And your objects that are chakra related? Yeah, this is a visualization actually of what is what, what is in the body and which uh, Western people no normally don't see. So I just wanted to make it visible and maybe, yeah, uh, make people to ask questions like you do. Maybe you get curious and try to find out. <laughs> Was it an answer to your question? Thank you for your presentation, it was really touched. Um, I think it's more like an add-on and a comment rather than a question, let's say. Um, I just, um, because I'm wearing this and it's someone else made this for me and it's made out of shell. Um, and I think they connect a lot. But for this one, it's like, um, it's more uh, of craftsmanship when they're making these things they put on that they put in their good spiritual energy or like their good spirits in the objects um so it's like more about feelings or like um transmitting feelings through the objects in a way um but for yours i think you have so many trust on this material in a way um but i was just thinking like how can this thing, sorry, uh, I was thinking about 
the owner of the objects, like how will they relate to the materials like you do if they're, they don't really know about like, sorry, I don't know what I'm talking about, but <laughs> 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 I just feel like I want to say something. But no. um, yeah, it's more like the spiritual and the consciousness and like how do you relate these two things or do you see them like together in a way? Yeah, the the word, also the term spiritual can be confusing because it's, um, there are so many prejudices and many, what should I say? It is used in ma very many strange ways. So there are every reason on earth to be suspicious towards it. So th that's why I've changed now to more talk about consciousness uh, because I think that is what spirituality actually is about, is to be conscious, to realize that it is something behind here, uh, behind the thoughts, behind the feelings, behind the uh, physical sensations, that which is aware in us. And that's an extremely fascinating thing, which we are not um, encouraged to, uh, to relate to. Yeah, because the first picture you showed us, it's this Inu man wearing this belt with those ritual it's almost ritual objects and then as an inspiration for you from there and now change to consciousness so i thought it's like a really interesting progress mm. yeah i think too and i was a little bit surprised uh, after a while when i realized it <laughs> thank you for your comments and questions Thank you.